All right, we are right now on the final lap of our conversation for today. If you're just joining us, this is News Hub. And what we're talking about now is about the state of the nation, uh, state of the nation, peace building, and the way forward. The security situation is, is getting out of hand. How do we bring peace and ensure that people live in prosperity and enjoy the wealth that they build for themselves in Nigeria? Well, uh, doing justice to this topic will be Alester Wilcox, who is right here in the studio. He's a public affairs analyst, and he'll be, you know, given his own perspective on the issue. Good morning, uh, Mr. Thank Wilcox. Thanks me. for joining it's, us on News Health. It's my pleasure. All Thank right, you. and we have in our Potakot, uh, studio, Deborah F. Young. She's the director of Rise for Gender and Livelihood Initiative. Thanks for joining us on News Hub, uh, Deborah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Good morning. Nice to see you uh, smiling there. Uh, all right. While we wait for um, our Buja guest, let, let's come to, come to the studio where we have um, Alistair Wilcox. Can you give an assessment of the security situation in Nigeria? Well, for me, it's quite a difficult question to answer, really, uh, because uh, um, most times people don't agree with my position. Um, yeah, just like in every clime where you have humanity, even among animal kingdom, uh, there are conflicts, um, there are criminalities, um, there are infractions as to the normal uh, standard behavior everybody, everybody expects. That's why you have law enforcement agencies, security agencies, in, even no matter how remote a place is, you have some form of security. So there is always that um, infraction because everybody in society cannot behave the same. It has never happened, it will not happen, and we don't ever expect to happen. Now, but the problem is how do you react to some of these things and how it's your perspective to them. I would think that um, maybe sometimes um, our situations get so bad to the point that uh, the way it is reported sometimes also link credence to the fact that sometimes the way it, uh, it creates more fear and um, mm. I'm told that in, 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 in journalist's uh, circle, good news does not make news, bad news make news. So it's always uh, important, it, it's always most time that uh, only the bad things are, that are brought to the fore, why the good things are, do not come to the fore. So I would think that um, we have it, we have just like every other country, we have challenges on our hands. Uh, but these challenges are surmountable and uh, if we all work together and uh, have the right perspective and the right attitude towards them, we will we'll summon them. Mm. All right, Let, let's get to uh, Deborah, who is in uh, Port Harcourt. We'll do a compare and contrast here with what is happening uh, in the southwest uh, against what is going on um, in the Niger Delta. Port Harcourt is uh, the, the hot seat of politics and the economy in the Niger Delta. And uh, I think that uh, Deborah you can give us a fair assessment of what you, of what you think have been the most pressing uh, uh, social, economic, or security challenges facing people in the Niger Delta, especially in Port Harcourt, where you are. W what is the state of affairs there? Um, well, um, uh, I don't think the situation in Port Harcourt is uh, actually very different from the rest parts of the country. Um, the Niger Delta is actually a region that is a with very contradictory trends. Um, we keep having repeated issues of uh, violence and then also cycles of, um, of, of instability and insecurity. There is no particular state in the Niger Delta that is entirely free from um, the security, the insecurity. And the situation, for me, I think personally that the security Security, the security situation in this country is actually bleak. And sometimes I sit and I reminisce and I said, how did we get to this point as a people? We are not safe. It's bad. The situation is bad. Um, there may be hope if we can get the institutions to wake up and do their job, but we keep having repeated cases of missing persons, cases of kidnap, you know, I mean, violence erupting from different parts of the region. And then particularly also even the environmental challenges are compounding our situation. When you talk about the socioeconomic situation in the Delta, I mean, livelihoods are greatly, you know, disturbed. 
there's a whole lot of interruption of livelihoods in the region. And all of this becomes exacerbated by the level of insecurity, by the level of, you know, disturbances and the issues that keep propping up. You know, we are told that the region is a region that is the economic nerve of the nation. And because of oil in the region, you have issues like every area in the region is, is gone is gone because you we, we keep dealing with issues of environmental environmental pollution environmental degradation you are seeing all the young men now in the bush all the young men right now are in the bush and we begin to ask ourselves is this an environment you know that we hope to live in in the next 50 years what kind of environment are we bequeathing to our children i'm not here to discuss environmental issues, but you cannot entirely talk about this region without directing our minds to the, you know, to the oil situation, the, eco the oil and economic activities that go on per second in the region. The entire region is gone, you know, criminal activities everywhere. And then you find the boys shoot, you know, they're always in the shootout with law enforcement agencies. You also see that the law enforcement agencies themselves in trying to, 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 to keep the place together, they get compromised. They are also part of the problem of the region. So there is a whole lot that is going on. You know, we may not have a full security picture, but we are not unaware of the fact that there is so much that is going on that is unreported. Hmm. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for that. While Alistair Wilcox in the studio, uh, if we come back to Lagos, is saying that sometimes the media, you know, have their own part to play in exaggerating some of these things. On the other hand, um, um, Deborah is saying that some of these things are even underreported, you know? Well, I thank God uh, Deborah is speaking from my states, and uh, so she can capture vividly what is happening. Uh, my position is the fact that um, sometimes, we, use the, we have used this word insecurity so loosely, too much, so too much, so muchly loosely that we are not able to compartmentalize what we refer to as insecurity. Uh, or I, and I made mention the fact that there's always been criminality. Wherever there are human activities, is, is criminality the same thing as total breakdown of security apparatus? I don't think so. We, we unfortunately, in the last 20 years, or uh, let's say in the last, let's say 20 years, when the issue of agitations rear up their heads, it has been there. Agitations has been there, like in the it has always been there from the Wilson, Wilkin, uh, what they call Wilson Commission and all those times through uh, uh, pre independence area, up to independence and all what, maybe up to state creation. So but in the last 20 years, it took a different dimension. And um, they're now going to armed conflict and uh, that brings about uh, kidnapping and all those things that now snowball. I wonder if we discover that uh, these are some, I'm talking of what's really agitated from the, from the South South, where, where I come from and where Deborah is speaking from. I mean, when this is snowball, to the fact that uh, people now see that they can make money and then the political system does not help because it compromised the situation. And when the political actors compromise the situation, of course, the, the political actors control the security apparatus, so they also make them compromise. So we keep degrading the security uh, apparatus of the state through the political actors. Mm -hmm. And then, so that now snowball, and people now take advantage, you know, because I keep telling people something. I mean, I remember vividly, we used to have, the, the kind of crimes we used to have before, uh, that is deadly crime was armed robbery. And by then, it's more prevalent in the southwest. We know of the Oyinisu episode, we know of the Ram, you know, Rambo episode and all what not. So it's, uh, while the South South and the South East was dealing with, in fact, and in the North, you don't even hear of things like that. The South and the South were dealing with petty uh, issues. Yes, I'm robbery, but it was more pronounced in the Southwest. Until this era of um, big money crime through oil bond crane, through uh, kidnapping, now started, and the other, other areas discovered that it is lucrative. And of course, when something is lucrative, 
it seems to spread fast because I'm, when, when it, anybody, that, I mean, Nigeria, we're used to business, we know that okra is selling. Everybody wants to buy or sell okra. We know that, like today, I was discussing with somebody backstage, um, uh, media is selling now, and they will have, I'm sure if we count radio stations in Nigeria, TV and TV in Nigeria, I'm sure radio stations must be more than 500 radio stations in Nigeria because that's what is selling. So when something is selling, other people need this too. So we move from south south to southeast, of course, mm -hmm. it expanded. Mm -hmm. And now they not discover that we can't be left behind. These are so at every point in time, those criminalities extend. Yes, people say uh, we're, we're not safe. We're safe in Nigeria because, um, like I said, if every day now, for instance, today, today, for instance, if you go to Ajota, you go to uh, Jibowu, you go to Sele, you go to Maitu, mm. you will load vehicles that are going to the east will be more than 2,000. Go to Ore by 10 o'clock and see the array of vehicles mm. back to it. Mm. They will all get to their station. They will all get to their stations, to their station safely. Mm. But Paraventure 1 had uh, a, a case of uh, kidnapping or armed robbery or mm. whatever. Mm. What will be the news? And as I said, the, the good news doesn't make, the good things doesn't make news. Mm. Mm. But the bad one, now that's one that is affected by either uh, kidnapping activity or armed robbery activity. That is what will be reported, and the, 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 the narrative will become we are not safe in our country. So, so, I am not undermining the fact that people have been hurt, mm. people have been kidnapped, people have been uh, molested, people mm. have, been, have lost schools, are under siege and under attack. Mm. It's, a passing, it's, a, it's a challenge, right. a passing challenge, and right. just as other challenges right. are surmounted, right. I don't think we should... Um, we should too much degrade the country to that point that we say we are not safe. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to you, Alester, and um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll drill in some more into some of the things you've said. Heaven forbid that we get used to this level of no, 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 we can't. criminality. Can't, we can't I, I, like, I like the fact you say it's passing, so at least you admit that. Uh, there, are, there, are things, there are things which are abnormal with what is going on. I mean, people just can't get into their vehicles and move across the Niger and say that we thank God that we arrived safely. But yeah, it should yeah. be a normal thing. You should be able to move from one point to another point without envisaging fear. No, but uh, if you fly uh, and get down, by the time you take off and you get down, you say, thank God we arrived but safely. But a lot of people will prefer if they had the opportunity <laughs> to go by air and avoid <laughs> the marauders and the headsmen that they could meet, you know, if they get them on the expressway. But uh, Deborah F. Young, there's something I wanted to ask you about, which uh, in terms of what uh, we look at, usually in every planning model, the first thing is to identify that there's a problem. And after you've identified what the problem is, you're probably going to have objectives and strategies and goals on how to resolve those problems, which you tie back to what the problem really is. Um, Alesta talks about... Um, um, you can, yeah, Deborah, great. So you, 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 you and Alesta, you're on the same page in terms of uh, physical insecurity, but you delve into something I also think which we also forget many times, which is also tied to the level of insecurity we have, which is the, um, the, the social, social security. Um, people don't have jobs, people don't have um, access to health care, education, opportunities. Those are the things um, that a lot of those indexes, which puts Nigeria on the lower rungs, talk about. Uh, youth Development Index, uh, Development Index, my Development Index. Most development indexes you can find around the world, Nigeria features at the lower rungs because of those parameters we don't have access to. One of those parameters is women. We don't include the women in discussions, we don't include the women in the plans, the women which are tied directly to the number of children who go to school, who give birth. Everything lies with the girl child and with the woman, more often than not. Um, help us understand, in the Niger Delta, has there been an improvement for what you've seen? Is there more inclusion in getting women involved in the discussions? Um, like I said earlier, the situation in the country seems to be similar. The Niger Delta is not a uh, unique in terms of the challenges that, that is confronting the region. The, the issues of women inclusion is more of a national than a regional thing. Um, in the Niger Delta or in the South precisely, um, there's a whole lot of interventions that has been going on uh, with respect to engaging women in the political process and also getting women to have their voices heard. 
we've been working at the local, at the state, and also even at the national, regional and at the national level to amplify the voices of women. But when you look at, you know, the, the, the result and the impact, it still doesn't look like there is a corresponding, a corresponding or matching, matching result and interventions that, that have been put in place. Women are still very down the ladder. Women are still far below. In the states here where I reside and also work River State, um, there seems to be a bit of a commendation on the part of the government here because we have women who populate the executive arm of government. And then we also have women in the judiciary. We have women also hold a few, you know, uh, political office appointments. But in terms of elective positions, women are still, it's still a far cry. Women are still below and grossly underrepresented in elective positions, you know, in River State and also other states taking also you know a look at other states despite legislation despite the fact that um, a lot is going on at the level of civil society at the level of the international community in terms of funding do not support and then in terms of also media awareness and media visibilities we are giving to these issues you find that women are still very underrepresented when you also look at the social indices women seem to be a lot more affected we've done some programs in the past we've had you know uh, a project that was a usid supported project you were one of the core clusters on that project and part of what we were looking at is you know the the multiple taxations women face especially in the informal sector they go out there daily display their wares and they are unable to get back home with what should fit the family, with what should take care of the family. You find out that you have different groups coming for different kinds of levies. And then most families, you know, in today's Nigeria, and of course, even in the past, you know, are products of table markets. If women have to face these kinds of heavy burdens, lots of households are women, women led, you know, women now, we are having a lot of female headed households, either by, by reason of um, the fact that the man can no longer, you know, uh, take care of responsibilities, you know, the home keeping or sorry the home the breadwinning responsibilities you find that a lot of women are emerging as as heads of households now and then when you're unable to take care care of the basic bills send children to school you know take care of the shelter take care of the feeding you find out that it has a direct impact on the society and in the system juveniles are everywhere in most of our interactions and discussions with them you trace them to the dysfunctional settings in the family because it's becoming increasingly difficult to feed becoming increasingly difficult to manage you know as families and these children will take to the streets the moment they get into the streets you know or they hit the streets it becomes a problem for the society so I think very strongly, the more we have women empowered, the better for society, you know, the better in terms of our, our results, we will get better results, we will have, you know, more children, better managed, you know, and because by design or by providence, women were created you know, to be able to manage that unit of society, the family. And when once the woman is distracted, when once the woman is not able, you know, is not able to assert, assert her role, it becomes a problem, a huge one for that matter. When you also look at the issues of inclusion, you know, in political processes, we have been engaging, talking about the affirmative action principle, the affirmative action rule, and trying to see how we can, you know, get political office holders to, to, to be a lot more gender sensitive, you know, in NOMI, because most, I mean, the way politics is played in this part of the world is more from selection and nomination. It's not just about being elected. People are nominated and people are selected you know, to stand and contest elections. So in all of those maneuvers within the political party structures, is there a way we can be deliberate and intentional in ensuring that we get women, you know, to come out, nominate, 
you know, select them, just like we have the godfathers who come out and then select and nominate people who would stand in for political office. Can we do this? Can we get more women into political offices? And then we watch the game change, you know? Everything we do should all, should be about strategy. We should we 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 should be intentional about this. And until political parties get this intentional, it's going to be a bit difficult to have women. You can't. I, I watched a graphic illustration some time ago, and then when I looked at the graphic re, re, illustration, you could see you know women were kept on the same race track with men, and then before the women's race track were washing machines, you know, piles of clothes, gas cooker, groceries, and the rest of them. And then, of course, a crying baby by one corner. And then on the racetrack for the men, it was completely free. You can't put women and men on the same track and expect them to compete and then expect the same set of results. So if we can be intentional and get women into political offices and then, in the, you know, I, I, I ask a question, you know, if there are affirmative action, you know, principles in other spheres of government, the federal character, you know, principle is an affirmation action, affirmative act, uh, uh, affirmative action principle. Today we have the quota system. These are all affirmative action, you know, processes and principles in place. The current NDDC we have, even the Northern Commission, you know, that deals with is it solid minerals? These are all affirmative action measures to ensure that there is a bridge in the gap in terms of development. One aspect of society or one segment of the nation is not left behind, you know, in in the in the development of the nation. So we do this to bridge this gap to cover. So why not affirmative action in politics? If we can get more women, I mean, women are the only ones who understand their issues and can speak for themselves. A man cannot speak for a woman. It's impossible to get a man to sit down, you know, in the office a woman should occupy and begin to reason, you know. It takes a woman to, to deliver on health care. It takes a woman, you know, to deliver on those basics. We've talked about the interruption of livelihoods in the region, you know. You need to see the mess that is going on. Women are grossly disempowered. You know, they can hardly fix a meal. They can hardly do the things that they need to do. So the more we get women empowered, the better for the region and the better for this country. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Deborah, I'm speaking for women and um, hammering on um, inclusion of women in politics and governance and in other, you know, aspects of life. Let's come back to Lagos, um, Alistair Wilcox. I would have asked you to to react to that but let me just go on with the next question because i saw you nodding or do you want to quickly quickly drop something no, 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 I can't speak for the good thank you <laughs> no man has headed the ministry of women affairs in all the states of the federal and the state of the i mean so if no man has headed that ministry then i don't think uh, okay yeah let's leave, think, leave it for the yeah, women women affairs leave it for the women but let's yes, get they've always handled it and uh, we'll, we'll find women that have, have run me through the thoughts uh, the current majority of health in uh, State is a woman, and I salute her colleague. Well, she, she's doing fantastic things. The current vice uh, deputy governor of River State is a woman. Uh, 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 at the first time, she was doing fantastically well. At this second time, I don't have not been hearing much of her. And so there is a lot of action. I think sometimes I always say, and I'm saying clearly, sometimes women are their own worst enemies. Remember the Sarah Jubril episode? Uh, a woman came up for presidential uh, election, and in the Congress that has thousands of women, she got only one vote, which is her own vote. Ask me a question. Let's move on from there. Um, we, we'll talk about um, women issues more uh, in the subsequent um, editions. Yes. The, the news in the papers, it said about 1,000 Boko Haram, you know, um, insurgents surrendered, Iswap, Boko Haram Iswap um, insurgents surrendered. And um, Nigerians are at two levels now. One is saying they have to be punished, for their wrongdoings, they want to say, hey, take it easy. They've come to surrender. Take them in and find a way to, you know, ensure that they don't go back to doing what, you know, they are, uh, they've been doing before. What is your take on this? Because this is about peace building well, now. Well, thank you very much. Number one, I am happy or I, well, I'm delighted in one hand to say that maybe Nigerians agreed or at most Nigerians accepted the fact that there were progress and some people surrendered. 
maybe before you will have had. No, it's not true. What I do is a lie. It's propaganda. You know, when normally when we hear uh, Iswap or Boko Haram attacked and burnt uh, or destroy some things, we, we, we fly those news very fast. But when we hear that the Nigerian army uh, has successes and gains, it's a lie. Well, who can tell this? So in this in this case, I'm happy you're asking me this question and that means a lot of Nigerians agree to the fact that progress is being done in the war against terror and that the heat right now is on the enemy. Uh, I understand that uh, since the acquisition of certain uh, military uh, assets by the government, uh, there has been a lot of heat on the Boko Haram members, ISWAP, and so a lot of them are, are coming out from their hiding. Maybe their source of supply has been caught. There has been so much progress. So I salute the Nigerian Army, our military, for this feat that they are all achieving. I also understand that, uh, in fact, one of the one, most broadcast one was the, one of the cheap boy girls that got married to that himself, herself and the husband surrendered. So it shows one thing clearly, and which I said earlier, faces. We are getting to the point where the heat is now on the, on the enemy, and they are now at the back foot. And the Nigerian states and the Nigerian military, the Ghana Nigerian military, the Ghana Nigerian soldiers, police, air force, whatever, is now having the upper hand. So coming to uh, surrender, and, uh, there is, in every war, I mean, I think every, I'm not a military expert, but every conflict, is backed up by the Geneva Convention. Now, um, when somebody surrenders, the person will be profiled. They'll be profiling. Now, there are people that have direct, uh, 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 direct uh, 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 culpability. What I mean, direct culpability is the fact that either they are commanders, they bled operations, they are part of the, the think tank, they must be profiled separately. There are those that we are coerced, like we have child soldiers all over the globe, those that we are coerced, not by their own intentions. They may not have participated in any uh, heat, in anything that could be, they could be profiled separately. And then so, if that profiling is done, then we know those that deserve to be punished. There must be the stick and the carrot. There must be the stick and the carrot. As last time before, I mean, some people were making jests, oh, a Boko Haram comes out, you give them pardon, you do this, you do that. Look, if you arrest somebody, if it is an arrest at battlefield, such person is not entitled to, 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 to any, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, what I would call any kind of uh, concession. Mm. It's an enemy, it's caught in the, in, in, at the war front. So must be dealt with, in, 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 with, with, with military uh, precision. Anybody that comes out to surrender, just as, we, just as was done in the Niger Delta issue, when NFC, before the NFC, a lot of people has, right. those that were caught in the battle, a lot of people were, 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 were eliminated, they were decapitated and all, but those that came out to surrender and are taking NFC, right. they are treated separately. So if people come out to surrender, they must be profiled right. and treated based on the level of their culpability. That is called peace building. So that you don't lump every of them in one basket and say because it's a Boko Haram fighter. It may not just, it may be circumstantial. So they must be profiled properly and those that deserve rehabilitation, the child soldiers, the ones among them, the juveniles, will be taken care of. Right. Those that deserve to be brought before courts, tribunals, to face their crimes, must be, that must be done. So that it must be done We're and those have to. must be done and so that everybody, uh, I mean, so that everybody gets fair, just, just fair, uh, fair, fair, fair position of whatever culpability that they have done against Nigerian states. Right. We're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Alester Wilcox. Uh, Alester Wilcox is a public affairs analyst, and like I joke in his former life, or still his current life, is a chartered accountant. It's always my pleasure. I can only say, uh, God bless Nigeria. And thank God you. keep protecting our troops. Very much. And also in Port Harcourt, we thank also very much Deborah F. Young, the director of RISE for Gender and Livelihood Initiative. It's a pleasure speaking with us on News Hub. Thank you. Excellent. And it's a rolling conversation. We're going to keep uh, talking about these things and hope eventually we get to the bottom of it and prevent a real current. So that's our work cut out for today. It's time to vamenos. Well, this is Wati. Thank you so much for joining us on today's edition of News Hub. It's been a beautiful one. My name is Mercy Frank. Have an awesome day. And I'm Aurora Obo. Hasta luego. <laughs>